Hey, it's uh, Dave March, and welcome to Land of Confusion, uh, the show by Ricochet members, for members, where we interview members. And this is my co-host. Do that so smoothly. Um, hi, I'm Don Selman, um, Palo Alto, California, where it's drizzling and kind of dark and overcast. <laughs> it happens rarely, but that's happening now. Okay. And so I got all the lights on here. Perfect. And yeah, no, yeah, are, so used to seeing the sun coming through your windows and lining up your uh, background, but now it's like yeah. A, yeah. it's a, a very cloudy, overcast. Uh, we we kind of like it. For, like it for a change. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> here comes the rain, kind of thing. Nice. Yeah. Originally, we were supposed to try and get raw, uh, our hearing in here. Uh, e hearing's husband, but he doesn't oh. live on Ricochet like she does. So every so often, it was just like cross signals on when he could come in. So hopefully we'll get him here next week. And in two weeks time, we're hoping to have Gary McVeigh and Titus Tachira here to do some oh, sort of ricochet cool. film stuff. Oh, cool. But uh, fortunately, uh, C Mark L L Lardis has come in, C writer, and he has a new book that he's just gotten published. And we're going to talk to him about some just uh, the writing process and a little bit about uh, what's going on down in Texas since they're having uh, a little bit more freedom than the rest of us, I think. That's, I guess I could say that's sort of my fault since I am active in politics down here. Mm -hmm. So really, what, what do you do? Oh, uh, I work, I'm, I've been a precinct chair in the Galveston County Republican Party for a while. Um, I actually helped flip two counties from Democrat to Republican. In the 1990s, I lived in East in Ander Anderson County in East Texas, which had been a Democrat, blue dog Democrat stronghold forever. And I moved up there in 94, and by the time I left in 2001, um, it was solidly Republican, came down to Galveston County, and at that time it had been solidly Democrat pretty much since the end of Reconstruction, and by about 2010, we'd flipped all the offices here state or the countywide offices here to Republican. So it's amazing. It can, was, can, I mean, I, we didn't want, didn't plan on talking about it, but I'm, I'm yeah. really interested. <laughs> I mean, um, this is fascinating. Tell me more. <laughs> well, I was only part of it, but again, the, the real thing is it's, it, it comes down to what uh, Ronald Reagan said about the Democrat, he didn't leave the, the Democrat Party, the Democrat Party left him. And the thing is that in the 19, the Democrat Party has been moving less left consistently. Um, basically, the main reason why so many conservatives um, remain Democrat uh, through call it the 1950s and 1960s, they would have been more at home in the Republican Party. But the Democrats were, I hate to say it, but they were supporting segregation. You take that away and there's no reason for the Southern Conservative Democrats to stay Democrats because the rest of their values aligned more with the Republican Party. And <laughs> really and truly, um, I don't think a lot of them were comfortable with with the Jim Crow laws anyway. Um, again, uh, the Democrats in Texas have had a long history of race baiting. Um, in the late 19th century, Hispanics were considered white until the Democrat Party changed that. So, um, well, there was no. Um, I think the word Hispanic was was invented in the sixties. Is that right? I don't know. Um, I wasn't here. I was in Michigan in the sixties. Okay. <laughs> okay. I I came down here in seventy nine. Mm -hmm. um, 
and it's it's as I said, um, at that time, every once in a while, the Republicans would elect a governor, but that was about it. And then starting in the 80s and 90s, the state started uh, moving more to the Republicans because as I said, there was no reason for most Texans to stay in the Democrat party other than the fact that that was daddy's party and granddaddy's party and, mm -hmm. and all that. But um, the, the other thing is that at least initially the internet was a big boon to the Republicans because particularly once the Thomas server came out that made the congressional votes visible, we could build cases against individual Democrats that pretended to be conservative when they were in Texas, but voted liberal. Mm. Um, hold, do folks know what you're talking about here? The, uh, the Thomas server. Yeah. Um, I'm, who, I'm not, who am I asking? I'm, the, 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 yeah, um, the, explain the it for the folks back home there, Mark. <laughs> okay. The Thomas server <laughs> was the first server that the, federal government had the, where, where they posted all of the bills and made it available on the internet. And it also showed the interim votes, the committee votes, and the various um, votes to commit. And there were several representatives, congressional representatives, that um, were voting conservatively on the final bill so they could tell the folks back home, well, we voted against gun control. But you could see that they voted for all of the bills in committee and in each intervening step. So, you know, Joe, how did it even get to the House floor if you were against it? Because you were on this committee and it should have died there. Mm -hmm. So we were able to build cases that certain representatives that were that claimed to be uh, conservative were actually consist consistently voting with the liberals, and then we replaced them with uh, Republican, um, you know, representatives, and we also started working on the state level. Uh, the first campaign I worked on was for a gentleman by the name of Todd Staples, who was running for the Texas House back in 90, I think 94. And he won, and this was in East Texas, and it was the first time that there was a Republican uh, repre state representative from East Texas since Reconstruction. Um, the main town in Palestine, Texas, in Anderson County is Palestine, Texas, which was an old railroad town. And it was also the home of Judge John Reagan, who was the postmaster general during the Confederacy for the Confederacy, and then a longtime Texas senator after that. Wow. Um, so, you know, it was, it was really... Uh, you know, Democrat territory up until then. And um, basically, you know, this, this was when Phil Graham was getting his start and, and building up. So the time just ended up being right. People were tired of the Democrats, particularly of the Democrats in Washington, D.C., trying to impose their values on Texas. <laughs> But Sounds the thing kind of is, familiar. you you don't get those votes unless you actually go out there and ask for them. And that was part of what we had were doing, is we were going out and canvassing neighborhoods, and you know, knocking on people's doors and saying, "Here, uh, we would like you to vote for you know whatever the name of the person was." We would explain why. We would explain how the Democrats were hurting them. And actually the biggest issue in 94, as is, as will be, I'm sure in 2022 was gun control because 
these, you know, the, the Democrat that we had representing us in the House at the time um, talked a good game about how he was going to protect our gun rights, but did not. And that ended up being a big selling point. And basically in 90, I'm thinking it was 94, um, there was a guy named Pete Sessions that ran for Congress in my district and lost, but he came very, very close. Um, there was, ended up being a split due to the libertarian, uh, libertarian candidate, the, the Democrat candidate came in with less than 50%. I think it was like 40, 49.2. Pete Sessions had 48.6 or 7, as I recall. Wow. And the Libertarian had the, the rest of them. Mm -hmm. And then Pete Sessions ran again two years later and won. And he remained in Congress until... 20, I'm thinking 2018. So the last congressman that I helped get into Washington from Anderson County was Jeb Henserling, who was another solid conservative, although Henserling left uh, basically because he said he was only going to stay there for three terms, and he stuck to that. So... But basically, if, if, if you're tired of Democrats, you have to go out in your neighborhood and convince people to vote for the Republicans. You can't now, now stand. You said, you said um, that you were a precinct captain? Precinct, chair. Right? precinct chair, yes. Precinct chair. Right. Um, my eyebrows sort of went up a little, up and down a little bit there because that's been in the news lately. Um, that uh, GOP has something like hundreds of thousands of open precinct positions. That's right. That's how I ended up getting to be a precinct chair. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it that was, was a open. while ago. It's still uh, today. Is is it the same or is it changed? It, it depends. Um, I stepped down from being the pre being the precinct chair of my precinct when my wife came down with cancer because I simply didn't have time to devote to it. And now there is a precinct chair in Galveston County. There are several dozen precincts without chairs, and if you live in those precincts and you want to be the precinct chair, it's really easy to convince the local party um, that you'll fill that role. Mm -hmm. So this is good advice, people. Good yeah. advice right here. No, it is. All the people on the Ricochet Comet saying they can't make a difference. This is how you make a difference. This is how you oh, do it. Let, <laughs> me, let me tell two stories about how my vote made a difference, okay? Great. The first one was back when we were in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and there was a, a very hotly contested mayoral race. And my wife and I were down with the flu and they called us up and said, have you voted yet? And since we were both down with the flu, we said, yeah, we've already voted. Okay. But they were, they were saying, oh, well, we'll even take you to the poll. Yeah. But we didn't feel like it. Well, the guy who won the election won by two votes. Yeah. <laughs> actually by one vote. So had we voted, the it would have flipped the other way. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, um, when I, I was telling you that I had worked with Todd Staples to get him elected to the Texas House. Well, at that same election, um, the Republicans had taken charge in Tarrant County for the first time, and they excluded all of the Democrats from being election workers and in that county. And of course, the Democrats screamed like stuck pigs. Um, however, at, the at that time in Texas, whoever 
was the county clerk appointed all of the election workers. And in, in uh, Anderson County, of course, those, those were all Democrats. They didn't allow uh, Republicans to serve as election workers. And the day after the, you know, when this came up, I called up Todd and said, Todd, how would you like to be in Texas Monthly's 10 best representatives? <laughs> and he laughed and, you know, because Texas Monthly is a very liberal <laughs> magazine. Yeah. And he laughed and I said, no, no, I'm serious. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to introduce a, a bill in the Texas House um, this January when the, when the term starts with the following proposal that because you were so upset about what happened in Tarrant County, and that is that the election judge in each precinct uh, is the party that won that precinct, and the alternate judge is the party that got the second most votes, and that the clerks get split between the two. And you're going to say you're going to do that because that's the only fair thing to do. And you were really upset about what happened in Tarrant County. And the Democrats can't really object to that, can they? Because they've been complaining about Tarrant County. Mm -hmm. And he thought about it a while and he started laughing. And sure enough, in the Texas House that next session, they introduced a bill that said that the election workers had to be split between the two parties pretty much along the lines I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And then in the very next election, something very, very strange happened. Mm -hmm. And that is that in a lot of counties that had formerly been solidly democratic, Republicans either won or had much, much larger margins than they had in any previous election. Mm -hmm. And the effect was so great that the Republicans actually swept all the statewide seats. Wow. Well, the thing is that now, now I'm not saying I'm I'm not saying that the Democrats were collect, committing election fraud. That'd be crazy. That's so but, rare that that ever yes. happens there, Mark. We need to yes. But one of that. the things about having both parties at each precinct and each, each ballot box. There's a whole bunch of different election fraud that becomes a whole lot more difficult. Yeah. So I'm sure this was just completely coincidental. Mm -hmm. And then the other strange thing that happened, this was after I left Anderson County, uh, they passed another law in Texas that required the ballot boxes to be locked. And all of a sudden the Republicans started winning by even greater margins because there were still a number of precincts where there were only Democrats, you know, largely because of those vacant precinct chair seats and things like that. Yep. But can one person make a difference? The answer is yeah. And I, I know it because I'm, I've done that twice. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, the once in that one election that was decided by one vote and once in getting Texas to change its laws about how you run elections. Mm -hmm. And that actually amazed me because especially the second one, because up until then, I've been one of those people that said you can't make a difference. Right. But by golly, once once in a while, lightning strikes. So, so, so since you've done this, um, what advice would you give to our listeners um, call um, about, about finding out uh, what positions are open in their local uh, precinct for their party okay. and who to talk to, how to get involved? What, would, what, what would sort of suggestions would you have? Okay, very simple suggestion. Go on the internet and do a web search for Republican Party, whatever the county you live in is. It? You know, Republican uh, Party of Galveston County, 
you know, Republican Party of Contra Costa County or whatever, you know. Oh. I thought that's where you live. <laughs> um, they should have a website or at least contact information there. Call that, that's them true. Uh, GOP every, has um, a website for every county, I believe. Yeah, and they've got contact information there. Call up the contact number. Find out who the chair is of the party in your county um, and volunteer to help. Find out when they're meeting. Show up at those meetings. Uh, one of my sons actually is doing that in Denton County now um, and start volunteering. And if there is an open, um, if there's an open uh, precinct chair where you live, volunteer to take that. Mm -hmm. The duties aren't that onerous and it's kind of fun. You know, it, what kind it, of what kind of positions are are do they have available typically? You mentioned precinct chair, right? Are there um, others? There are technically there are there are like uh, assistant chairs, but mostly because all of this tends to be unpaid. It's just you volunteer. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got people that volunteer to work at the at the offices or man phone banks or answer the phone at the, at the party. Um, the, the party will typically have either a county convention every year, yep. every other year, um, or a district convention. Um, in, in Anderson County, it was a county convention in um, Galveston County, they've got it's split between two districts, largely because um, you've got a much bigger population base in Galveston County than you did in Anderson County. Anderson County was about 50,000 people, including 10,000 that were in the state prisons there. So, um, whereas Galveston County, um, the smallest the largest town has a hundred thousand. So, um, but you know, and that, that's another thing you can do at the end. If at each election, you can, they typically have what's called a precinct convention at the end of the day. Yeah. And if, if you're interested in, in participating in that, you just show up. And the precinct conventions choose who's going to the county or district conventions, uh, and they choose who's going to the state convention. So typically, the people that go to the state convention have been folks that have been involved for several years. I went to a state convention once when I was in Anderson County. Um, Again, by the time I was being considered for that, that was about the time my wife got sick when I was in Galveston County. And I just flat wasn't interested mm -hmm. at that time. Um, but it's actually kind of fun to go to one of those state conventions. It's entertaining to go to a county or district convention. Uh, those That's where the precinct convention are where you turn in the resolutions that make up the platform for right. your your party. And then from there, it goes to the county party, uh, to county convention, and they uh, consolidate all of the resolutions mm -hmm. and they go from there. Um, the other thing is you can run for public office uh, I never did while Jan was alive because I would have been assassinated. She <laughs> said that she would kill me if I ran for office. And Don't worry, my girlfriend has the same viewpoint. She's like, she, she she's also involved in politics, but not as much as she used to be. That's how we met. We met scrutiny. Yeah. for different parties. 
<laughs> oh, fun. <laughs> yeah. And she so did she's now become a bit more right wing in her older age, but uh, she's decided to get out of politics. But she she's like, Dave, you're never allowed to run for any uh, public office, but you can run for political. Par-. She's fully in support with me running inside the party. Right. And that was pretty much Jan's position. Mm partly because she wanted to make sure that um, we had candidates that agreed with our views. Mm. And that's how you do it. Right. Um, and, you know, the, the, the most important thing to remember is that where politics differs from war mm. is at the end of it, whoever has been defeated is still alive. <laughs> and they'll be around next time. Mm -hmm. So you have to remember Abraham Lincoln's aphorism that the surest way of eliminating an enemy is to turn him into a friend. So, you know, this is, this is something I think people forget um, that after the, after an inter-party fight is over, you can't, stomp on the ego of the people that you defeat. Right. Um, otherwise, they won't be back. Or they will be back and they'll line up with the other side. Mm. So, but yeah, call up, call up your local party, county party, find out where they're meeting, find out how you can help. And remember that the politics, retail politics is where they really make the difference. That's where you get the candidates from. Yeah, every once in a while you get celebrity candidates, but most of the time, the people that end up getting elected to state office are just people from your, ordinary people from your community. And they go from there. Um, You know, some of them are very talented, but again, you have to find the folks that line up with your views and you have to support them. You have to go block walking, um, go to, I don't know if we'll ever have them again, but uh, you know, the dogwood festivals or whatever things they've got in your, in your area and man the booths there and say, this is why you want to vote for a conservative candidate. Right. And it doesn't happen by itself. I mean, I, I, I'm personally tired of people that don't get involved and then complain about what happens afterwards. Right. Right. So. I, I just want um, to point yeah. out, I, I just wanted to have a moment. Uh, if you're more interested in more, hearing more of what, what Mark was just talking about and want to watch another episode, watch the episode Randy Wivoda. He is also a former county chair and has county a lot to say in this kind of situation as well. So, Yeah. Was he a county chair? Yeah, I think so. And he, he, he talked about getting pre, uh, made to like start off in the precinct. He's okay. had a hand in running things. That, oh, good uh, like, for him. Uh, running like the South uh, is North Dakota, I believe is where he lives, uh, uh, getting there, helping to get the whole thing, going to the state conventions okay. and all that. I mean, it's always easier when you live in a small state where you can really have a big f- uh, impact on things. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, again, I got involved in retail politics mm-hmm. when I was in a rural, co- living in a rural county for about eight years. Mm-hmm. And frankly, that was the only entertainment around. <laughs> that and... Actually, that, that's how I got into writing, because I had lots of free time. Um, they ended up doing, uh, the local population ended up putting on a, on a lot of plays and things like that, because there wasn't anything else to do. So there are advantages to living in rural areas. You have to make your own entertainment. You have to start thinking for yourself. Mm-hmm. So... So I'd recommend looking for local organizations right. along these lines. Uh, besides the county GOP groups, there are other uh, nonprofit organizations. 
um, where I live, um, we have a group called Liberty Forum of Silicon mm -hmm. Valley. Yeah. And they um, have a meeting once a month where they bring in a speaker. And it's all the, it's sometimes an eight, eight level uh, mm -hmm. speaker. And um, the uh, 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 Rob Long recently. Oh, um, really? I know yeah, you were telling well, us about John Yu. I just heard you had to uh, send him a hundred McRibs and he agreed to anything you had to say. <laughs> yeah, John Yu was on recently. Uh, mm -hmm. Rob Long was on last year. Um, uh, 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 Lilacs has been on twice in recent years. So um, yeah, it's uh, this is a group that has, they, they rent out a hall and just have this meeting and, and once a month and there's a speaker there and it's great. Um, and that's Silicon Valley. And I'm, I'm sure there's lots of groups around. Um, right. I did a post a while back, maybe we can find it, of where I listed local groups here and encouraged other folks to uh, describe the local organizations around where they live. Right. And, and there, are, just do, there are several in Galveston County as well. A lot of them are organized around the Republican Party. They aren't quite as fancy as the Liberty Forum, but every county is going to have that. And again, you get involved and you know, part of it is we need to make sure we have a good slate of candidates for the 2022 election. And this is the year to find out who those people are. So when it comes time for them to file, actually, they have to file the uh, for candidacy at the end of this year in most states. Uh, I think the deadline in Texas is sometime in December. So if you wait until if you wait until next year, you're going to be too late to affect the primaries in your state, which means you get a whole bunch of of you know Cheneys and Myers. <laughs> um, and if you wait until... Oh, we lost you, Mark. I think you hit the mute again. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you wait until you know the fall of 2022, you're almost too late to support whoever won the primary. Right. So people need to get involved pretty much now, you know, call up, call up your county, uh, GOP county, uh, Dem uh, county officer office uh, now. So. Yeah. Very, it's great, great, great advice. Yeah. Folks. And I just want to say a few other things. I, I'm from Canada, so I have a little bit of a different perspective. But I mean, I did the same thing. I'm like, what? I, I'd be a county chair in the United States. You've got the uh, metric federally. system. <laughs> and in pr provincially, like, there's like, I've been to many federal, I've been to one federal convention and I've been to usually the provincial convention or state convention. And I can say the hospitality suites are great. Uh, it's always nice to have unlimited scotch being poured into your cups because if that's your thing, uh, by like lobby, well, he'll lobbyists who want to get your opinion hanging out. Like, uh, I remember one convention where a guy and I are standing there and this, he's a, like a local MPP. So like a state representative and he and I are standing and about to say hello. Then this woman comes over and starts talking to him and the music's super loud in this room. And she's, he's talking to her very nicely. She wanders off to go wherever. And he turns to me, Dave, I have no idea what she was saying to me. <laughs> and now that guy's minister of labor. All right. Okay. Oh. oh, and one last thing you can also like, I'm not too sure how it works in the States, but you can also around here get appointed to, political positions. I got recently appointed to a political position, uh, a political appointment. So like the honors list in England. So you can get like appointed commissions and other things that will help you out and like be plums yep. in your hat locally, press your friends and relatives. You, know, you can do the um, same thing here 
Um, mm -hmm. I'm on the local library board, for example, in, in League City, Texas. Mm -hmm. And there are always openings for the various county and city advisory boards. Mm -hmm. Except if you're talking about a really big city where the graft makes those positions desirable. Right. So um, there was something about a book. Yes, there was a, something about a book. So why don't we bring up the share screen on that? Okay. Um, let me do that. <laughs> see if it, okay, can you see? There you go. Okay. And this is my latest book. It is part two of a two-part series I wrote for Osprey about the Battle of the Atlantic from the air perspective. In other words, the role aircraft played in the Battle of the Atlantic. The first book was this one, um, Battle of the, which covered the years 1939 to 19, the end of 1941. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm limited to 35,000 words in each one of these books. Uh, and this was a very large and complex subject, even though we're just limiting it to the role aircraft played. So mm -hmm. 19, uh, December 1941 proved to be a good break point, not just because the U.S. entered the war at that point and all of a sudden the, the battlefield expands suddenly. Um, but because by December 1941, the British had finally put together all the pieces they needed to win the Battle of the Atlantic. Right. Um, that was in that month, two things happened, uh, which basically doomed the U-boats. The first one was a convoy battle that was fought on a Gibraltar to Liverpool convoy, yeah. which was escorted by uh, the escort carrier Audacity, and in which the Germans lost, I believe it was six U-boats and a couple of um, eight U-boats and a couple of Focke-Wulf uh, 200 Condors. And in exchange, they sank four ships, which is a really bad exchange rate. Right. <laughs> um, the other thing that happened was a uh, swordfish, which was a biplane torpedo bomber, but this one had been modified to have radar, mm -hmm. and it sank a German U-boat at night using radar. And that was the first time that happened but it was the harbinger of what would eventually destroy the U-boat fleet. The, the second book, the one that just came out, covers what happens immediately after the United States enters the war and from there to the end of the war. And, you know, this is going to be a spoiler, but the basic fact was that the Allies had to lose the Battle of the Atlantic. There was no way that the Germans could win it. Mm. And in fact, there should not have been a Battle of the Atlantic because uh, the reason why the, the, nobody built up a large commerce raiding submarine fleet between World War I and World War II was because they knew that the, that form of warfare was obsolete because of the aircraft okay in world war one a, con con a combination of convoys and aircraft had had doomed the, the german u-boat war commerce war mm -hmm. the the problem with that was not that it wasn't true it was true the problem was that it was like the old joke about the mathematician who's asleep in his hotel room, wakes up, sees the curtains on fire, sees a plastic wastebasket, sees the uh, tap 
in the bathroom, then says a solution exists, goes back to sleep, and burns to death. Mm. Okay. The aircraft could defeat the U-boats. The problem was at the beginning of World War II, Coastal Command didn't have any aircraft capable of sinking a U-boat because their main aircraft at that time was something called the Anson. It could carry 200 pound anti-submarine bombs. The British hadn't tested them. And it turned out they would they were incapable of sinking a submarine even with a direct hit. Mm. The British found that yeah. out when an Anson landed 200 pound bombs on one of their own submarines. And the submarine came back to port indignant about the fact that it had been attacked by a by British aircraft, mm -hmm. and it was completely undamaged. At which point the British said, "Oh, we have a problem." Right. Um, had the British had an aircraft capable of sinking a submarine in 1939, there would have been no U-boat war, because if they had sunk a U-boat 10% of the times that they had attacked it, the Germans would have been out of U-boats by December 1940, at which point they would have said, you know, everyone's right. You can't win a U-boat war. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't have gone into the massive production. Well, by 1942, the British had finally got, or as 1942 started, the British had finally gotten it right. They finally knew how to kill submarines. They finally had weapons with which to do that. Um, they didn't have enough of them because Bomber Command was just fixated on massive raids in Germany, and they would not free up more than a dozen long-range B-24 Liberators for Coastal Command. The United States had sold... I think it was 120 to Britain by that time. And Coastal Command got 12 of them. The rest of them were being used in Africa to conduct long range strategic bombing against targets in Africa. Yeah. Okay. Um, had they had, had the British had another two dozen of those things available in 1941, again, you would not have had the massive losses that we saw in early 1942. The other problem was that the front suddenly opens up with the American Atlantic coast being available. Right. And it's like in happy times is what they call, I believe. Yeah, the that's what they called it. Um, and again, the Americans made a very serious mistake mm -hmm. early on because one of the aphorisms in the American Navy was a weakly guarded convoy is worse than no convoy. And that's absolutely true if you are fighting a wolf pack. However, if you're fighting individual submarines, even an unescorted convoy will result in less and fewer losses than individual sailings. Yeah. The reason for that being is there's one new boat it can see about 10 miles around it. And if there are 50 ships sailing individually, you've got 50 times the chances of coming across it. And then you can sink those ships individually. And more than that, you can probably surface and sink them with a deck gun instead of a torpedo. Right. If you have, If you put all 50 of those ships in an unescorted convoy, the U-boat has one chance to see to, to for the convoy to come into its view. And when it does, it can't sink much more than it could have if the ships were sailing individually. Right. Okay. Now, if you've got a pack of U-boats, which the Germans were using in the Eastern Atlantic, that would be disastrous. But the problem for the Germans, especially in 1942, was that the, the American Atlantic coast was at the very limit of their endurance. Mm -hmm. So they were only able to send out individual submarines. And, uh, you know, it was very much a, a World War I style U-boat war. Um, you know, so that ended up being a, a big disaster. 
plus the fact the Air Force was in charge of anti-submarine, land-based anti-submarine aircraft when the war started, and they weren't very good at it. Right. Um, I remember a story of a German submariner who says it's broad daylight off the coast of like Miami. And he says he surfaces his sub in the midst of an American convoy, starts shooting things up, and he's watching, and his half his crew is watching girls in bikinis along the Miami Beach line. I, I think that one is apocryphal on several scores. One mm-hmm. is no U-boat would get close enough to shore to see the girls in bikinis because the water's too shallow. Yeah. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the U.S. wasn't running convoys. They were running ships individually. Oh, well, I think he came really close to shore. It was, uh, yeah. Yeah, was but like, still. He was hitting a harbor or something like that. It's a good story. Yeah, but again, it's a good story, but I doubt that it's true because no U-boat captain in his right mind. Was coming that close to shore, yeah. Would come. I think, he, with, I think it was a U-boat commander saying it. But I think he was just bragging. <laughs> well, I, it wouldn't surprise me. There's mm-hmm. there's a woman in this area who wrote a book called Thunder in the Gulf about U-boats in the um, Gulf of Mexico. And after that, she did a book about the mem- remembrances of the U-boat captains because she got this was this was back in the 80s when they were all still around the right. survivors that is and you know she did a lot of interviews with them and i read the second book and it had half a dozen stories that i remember from reading from count luckner's sea locker that was written between world war one and world war two <laughs> and at least to me it was obvious that these old submarine uh men we're telling war stories to this to to this pretty woman. Mm-hmm. You know, it it's one of the more fascinating things about history is sorting out the myth from the realities. Mm-hmm. You know, and again, that's one of the reasons why I found this book so fascinating, because there were a lot of myths about the U-boat war. Mm-hmm. You know, the you know a, a and it's as I said, there shouldn't have been one. Had the Allies been halfway competent at the beginning, it would have discouraged the Germans from even going into the massive U boat production. Mm-hmm. War might have gone very differently if they'd spent that steel on building tanks that went to Russia instead of building U boats that would end up getting sunk. Well, I guess uh, the British ended up doing some help on the. Uh... Uh, for the Russians, after all. <laughs> yeah, but it's not quite the type of help that they should Yeah, have. I know. I, they should have. Uh, so. I, I'm a big believer. I, I, as someone who does okay with the... I'm not as upset with the uh, British bombing offensive as some other people. I do think it did make some contribution to the war. But it certainly is true. They just took two or three squadrons off of uh, the battle line and use them to secure the shore uh, to the ocean fronts for a little while. Right. In 1942, we would have had a much more effective force in 43 and 44. Right. Right. And and the thing is that, you know, Churchill was talking about how nothing scared him as much as the U-boat war, but he mm-hmm. never acted like it. Yeah. So, you know, that, that kind of blindness is pretty common in war and not just... I, I'm, it sounds like I'm beating up on the, the British in this, but the Germans had their own sets of folly oh, yeah. in, the bat, in the Battle of the Atlantic, including the fact that they consistently underestimated uh, Allied shipbuilding and overestimated the kill rate that they were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Donuts planned on winning the war through what was called the tonnage war. It didn't matter what you sank. All that mattered is that you sank, sink as much as you can so that your enemy runs out of ships. But the problem was, particularly if you're dealing with U-boats, it's extremely difficult to determine, A, how big the ship you hit 
uh, mm. was, and B, if you actually sink the ship, mm -hmm. because you launch the torpedo, and then you slink away from there as fast as you can. You don't sit around and wait and, and count to see what ships got sunk. So you just make estimates. And we ended up having the same thing happen in the submarine war in the Pacific. The difference was uh, the U.S. signal intelligence was better than the German signal intelligence. So we actually knew how many ships got sunk. Yeah. So and for a while, actually, the German signal intelligence was very good. Um, and in fact, the, the, the other thing that fascinated me about the book is how much soft factors played a critical role in the battle. Mm -hmm. The fact that we knew where the German submarines were mm -hmm. meant that we could steer ships and uh, aircraft to where they were. Um, one of the people that shows up in this book and will show up in some other books that I've written is Admiral Dan Gallery, who commanded the Guadalcanal, which was an escort carrier that was part of a hunter-killer group. And in his memoirs, which were written in the 50s, he marvels at the ability of U.S. naval intelligence to send his task group to exactly where the German submarines were. And his only conclusion was they had an officer that could just think like a U-boat captain. Well, in actuality, the guy that was planning all this was reading the Germans' mail and knew where the U-boats were. The trick was to tell Gallery where to go without making it obvious that we knew where the U-boats were because we were reading their mail. Right. So, uh, does it cover like the Battle of the Biscay with operational research, or does your book cover operational research at all? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Now, remember, this is 35,000 words, but mm -hmm. operational research, the fact that, that um, a large, fewer large convoys are easier to guard than a few, than many smaller convoys. Right. That's that was. Said. There were about half a dozen things that all came together in the first months of 1943 that an operational research contributed to part of it. Another thing was that they ended up getting what was called Mark III radar, which the Germans couldn't detect. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the Mark III radar uh, didn't wasn't as affected by the uh, ground clutter the way that the Mark II radar was. On top of that, they had something called the lay light, which was essentially a large spotlight under the wing of the airplane. In fact, you can see the lay light in the cover picture. Mm -hmm. And that would illuminate the submarine just at the point where the radar faded out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Plus, they got two new oh. weapons that appeared in this January 1943. One was a homing torpedo that aircraft could drop that would follow the German U-boat even after it was submerged and sink it if it's submerged. The other thing they had was the anti-submarine rocket. Is that and the guy illustrated in the cover? Um, no, that's just a 250-pound depth charge oh, okay. that he's dropping. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the homing torpedo was called FIDO, because, <laughs> the nickname, because it would follow the U-boats and sink them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, all of those came together. Um, in November 1942, there was disastrous losses but that was because all of the escorts were being used for the torch invasions of North Africa. Ah, okay. And there were very few available for the North Atlantic. Where the, mm. And the Germans hadn't expected the, the torch invasions for all their, all their U-boats were up in the North Atlantic. And then in March of 1943, again, everything went wrong. And there was 
massive losses. But then it's like I said, finally, oh, and, and the escort carrier also began to appear mm -hmm. in uh, the winter of 1943. So in March, May of 1943, everything came together and the Germans lost 43 submarines in one month. Holy crap. Wow. Yeah. Well, and half of them were to aircraft. Okay. Wow. So, well, I know uh, Don expressed it that he might have to yeah. take off right about yeah. now. Yeah, I got an exemption. So. Okay. But I think that's a great way. And if you want to know the rest of it, buy his book. Yeah. Yes. Well, buy the available wherever too. books are sold. As they say. Mm -hmm. I, I will have an Amazon, I guess. So. Yeah. I, I, um, uh, actually, how many books do you have? 36, 37. That you've published? That other people have, that I've written and other people have published, yes. Yeah, but with your name as, the, yes. well, as, as yes. an author. Yes, about wow. 34 Osprey and six for History Press and Arcadia. Mm -hmm. The two most recent Arcadia books, one is, the most recent one is Ellington Field, which is a history of Ellington Air Force Base, Ellington Field, which is about five miles from my house. And oh. it's the um, it's the air the airfield that NASA uses among other things, and it was also the airfield that George W. Bush flew out of when he was in the Air National Guard. He flew F one o twos. The other book that's recent is Houston, Vanished Houston Landmarks, and that's about fifteen places in Houston that used to be famous. That have disappeared. They were they were landmark things that are just gone now. So, cool. this, this, yeah. is a, this is impressive. Thirty seven books mm -hmm. under as an author and with various publishers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've got four under contract this year. Two, four others awaiting publication this year, and um. It, this is the season where I pitch books for Osprey for next for, to, to write in 2022. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'm hoping to get six written next year because I have a lot more time due to the COVID thing. Yeah. <laughs> That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Just fantastic. Okay. Yeah. So why don't we uh, leave? I think that's a great place to leave it. Like, yeah. Uh, 36 books is pretty in, impressive to me and uh, 37 37 and we'll be sure to see uh, I want to thank you for coming on in the last minute okay. and talking about us with all this and uh, I'll be seeing you after this show so okay. uh, thanks for coming on Land of Confusion guys and uh, go uh, call your local RNC take care folks Night. Okay. Okay. bye bye <laughs>